And what we're going to shift to now is the multidisciplinary management of patients with glioma. Uh, I'd like to, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mitchell Berger and Dr. Sean Hervey Jumper. Dr. Berger is the director of the UCSF Brain Tumor Center. He is the PI of the law, longest funded brain tumor SPORE award. And he is internationally recognized expert in brain mapping for brain tumors. And he is joined by Dr. Sean Hervey Jumper in this presentation. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery, and he has a clinical interest in mapping, uh, but also has a, a really robust research interest on language, motor, and cognitive recovery in brain tumor patients. So they will start off on the current modalities for the surgical management of gliomas. Okay, thanks, Suzanne, very much. And again, congratulations to Nancy Ann and Bjorn, who put this whole thing together, as well as Naomi who's done a magnificent job uh, setting this whole thing up. So I'm gonna tag team this with my partner and colleague, uh, Sean Jumper. Uh, and I'm gonna set the... ...over the issue of extent of resection and outcome to set the stage. So if we can... If I can advance this. There you go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we all know the situation with the reason why we do surgery and to suffice it to say for this section, it's really about how the extent of resection affects outcome for glial tumors. And Sean's gonna get into the surgical adjuncts in his portion of the talk, so I'm not gonna talk about that, but I'd like to set the stage for the aspect of extent of resection and outcome. Now there's a little bit of delay on advancing, so not quite sure how else to do this, folks. Yeah, there's gonna be a delay when you're doing in the Okay, room. right, okay. So I just wanted to say, and I wanted to give us a little uh, recognition on the neurosurgical side that, and this comes from a recent article in Dr. Cheng's, uh, who's a chief editor of neuro-oncology practice, showing how surgeons over time have made progress in achieving both the subtotal, but more importantly, the complete resection of these glial tumors. So let's jump into glioblastoma. We can look at this and ask the question, how do we decide what we're going to do? Let's step backwards to a study that we published several years ago, which took off from the original MD Anderson study in 2001, where they very significant uh, improvement in survival if we were more aggressive with the contrast enhancing portion, which we proved with over a 78% resection of glioblastoma. And again, just to put this into perspective, this is a really good article by a number of colleagues, including Mike Lance's group that looked at a meta-analysis showing without a doubt in this day and age, as opposed to when I started my career, extent of resection is critically important for glioblastoma, not just at the one-year mark, but at the two-year mark. So the onus comes back to us as neurosurgeons to do an aggressive resection, which leads us to this phenomenal was involved with under the direction of Annette Molinaro. And essentially what we wanted to do was just simply ask the question, is this still a valid approach during the molecular era? So we went back, looked at a very homogeneous population of patients who had the stoop regimen who were IDH wild type. You can see the distribution here, including the MGMT status of these patients and one of the things that hit us immediately with this was to show that, again, it confirmed our suspicions that you don't need to get to 98% as long as you can get much further than 75% of a complete resection or an aggressive resection, then that's what you should do. You don't have to always achieve 
a gross total resection. But most importantly, if you can't do much of anything other than a biopsy, you're not definitely not going to make an, uh, a difference in the outcome of the patient. So you want to get on this curve and then you want to push it further to get over here. And Sean's going to talk about the techniques that clearly allow you to do this. So what did we see in this population? We take the same population of patients that Ari Perry, David Solomon talked about in terms of the IDH wild type cases. And yet you have this tremendous distribution in that homogeneous population of patients. What was the critical feature? Well, we know that not giving Temidar, even in older patients, really is not valid anymore. We can discuss that as we go forward with the management part, but Temidar must remain a critical adjunct. And forgetting the IDH mutated patients, because we know that that group is very different five. And in addition to removing the contrast tissue, we go into the flare. This is the key. The key is that we have to be more aggressive than the contrast tissue. We've got to get out into the flare. And you can see that there are some intermediate risk groups here. What happens in the shifting of the curve when we go from these two populations here, where they're less than 65, which is the best scenario if we get out into the flare and leave less than five cubic centimeters versus those patients where we have to leave more than five cubic centimeters. So this is really, I think, going to result in a paradigm shift. And we confirm this with our Mayo Clinic and Ohio Brain Tumor colleagues that were able to verify the same stratification for the IDH patients. And the most important thing is that it's got nothing to do with the molecular status. So despite the molecular status, we have to be aggressive with the enhancing and the non-enhancing tissue. So that's the paradigm shift that we've learned and I've been very proud to be part of this publication. Now for low grade tumors, I'm gonna try to highlight some of these features. It starts with a study that I did here at UCSF published in the journal Clinical Oncology which showed unequivocally for the low-grade tumors that extent of resection is critically important like it is for these high-grade tumors. And this was done with quantitative volumetric analysis showing both at the level of extent of resection and the volume of residual disease that our patients were doing better, significantly better, if we could get more than a 50% plus resection. The French consortium looked at this as well, found essentially identical data, and this was non-volumetric, interestingly enough. And that explains why at 10 years, they weren't up at that 95% mark, but they showed a very, very clear cut correlation with extent of resection and outcome in their patient population throughout France. We know about the classic Norwegian study, which showed based upon whether a patient got a resection versus a biopsy, that those patients did better at the survival curves. You could see that there was really no rationale or support for biopsy anymore for low grade tumors. And again, the bottom line is you can be aggressive with the resection, but you clearly have to be safe. And that's what Sean's gonna discuss in a few minutes. This is another randomized study out of Germany. There aren't very many randomized volumetric extent of resection studies, but the ones that are done, including the ones I showed you from our group um, and this group from Germany, show very clearly that resection is favored over biopsy. This is a nice meta-analysis that some of us were part of, again, with Mike Lance's group showing, and this was published uh, actually in, in neuro-oncology, a couple of years ago showing very nicely that if you want to improve the outcome of your patients for low grade gliomas, you must strive for a gross total resection. We're now looking at this in the same way we did with the high grade tumors to see if we can also come up with numbers that are very significant in the molecular error. This is another meta-analysis showing that you can change the odds ratio if 
you do a better resection, gross total resection. This is a beautiful review of the literature, which confirms, confirms our suspicions. And then there's the issue of supertotal resections, meaning going beyond, just like what we did with the high grade patients. If you can go beyond the flare signal, do the patients do better? Well, it turns out in the French experience from Hugh Defoe, the recurrence rate's no different, but what is different is the fact that malignant transformation is reduced. Okay, so that sets the stage. I'm gonna stop here. Um, and I wanna turn it over to Sean because I think it's really important to understand if you're gonna maximize extended resection, how do you minimize morbidity? Sean, go ahead and take it away. Good morning, again, uh, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Sean Hervey Jumper. This is, I'm, I'm delighted at the opportunity to speak. Again, I'm a neurosurgeon and cancer neuroscience researcher here at UCSF. And um, I was given the task here of spending the next 10 minutes talking about focused on the how, right? Meaning how do we maximize extended resection? And how do we do it safely? So just as an outline, you know, Dr. Berger brief, you know, beautifully articulated why extended resection matters. And so let's focus on two concepts here, drill down on two concepts. One, how do we ensure that we don't hurt patients in the process of removing as much tumor as possible? And then how do we visualize tumor? How do we understand and visualize microscopic disease as we're trying to uh, maximize extended resection. And again, picking up from where Dr. Berger left off to frame the discussion, we've already talked this morning about different statistical modeling that we can use to determine outcome and the efficacy of many therapies, including surgery. And this work peer spearheaded by Dr. Molinaro included looking at clinical and molecular variables with respect to providing a roadmap for the value of extended resection. But as we look back on this data and under, to understand its impact, one of the variables we did not include in the study was were neurologic impairments and our clinical and molecular variables were recently reanalyzed and we added into the um, uh, statistical model neurologic impairments such as aphasia, motor impairments, vision, and cognitive impairments. And we found that in addition to maximizing extended resection and not enhancing disease, that new neurologic impairment stood out as an independent predictor, an independent important correlate of outcome, further stressing the importance of removing tumor in the safest manner possible. So here on the screen left, you have, have to give a cartoon, and this is really a schematic of our mechanistic understanding of how gliomas, particularly oligodendrogliomas and astrocytomas may integrate, disrupt, or displace networks or circuits or pathways of important functional significance. And our ability to identify these areas so that we can maximize extended resection while minimizing the neurologic consequences for our patients is really one important tool that we have. So one primary tool that we use to accomplish this goal is through intraoperating intraoperative functional mapping. And using intraoperative functional mapping, we're able to reduce morbidity or risk to our patients by roughly 60%. So now any patient with an intrinsic brain tumor within or in close proximity to a region of brain presumed to have functional significance as determined by preoperative counseling and imaging um, is really a candidate for functional mapping. And we don't determine who is a candidate or, uh, or not based on uh, imaging. We determine that based on our physio understanding of physiology and the patient's symptoms and discussion with the patient. So mapping is the key. This is our workhorse that we use to maximize extended resection for our patients. So how we map function during glioma resection. So we have a specialized team. This includes specialized anesthesiologists in addition to our excellent OR nurses. We have epileptologists for seizure monitoring, a physiologist for speech and language processing and administering of language and behavioral cognitive tasks. We have neuromonitoring teams. And the point of the neuromonitoring is not just our anatomic imaging, but we insert every imaging tool that we can use. We add every imaging tool, such as diffuser ten tensor imaging, DTI tractography, as well as functional connectivity measures using MEG into the operating room setting so that we can have that overlaid with our anatomic imaging to correlate with the physiology that we see in the interoperative setting. So other uh, adjuvants and tasks and things that we use in the operating room, we have our testing battery, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. 
We have to peak, keep our patients warm. We have used now a combination of low frequency stimulation. This is bipolar stimulation using a Ogeman stimulator, usually between 50 and 60 Hertz, depending upon where you are in the country or in the world, combined with high frequency monopolar stimulation for subcortical mapping predominantly here, as well as electrocorticography. And this is the tool that we use to identify the presence of seizures during our physiology mapping to make sure that we're understanding our results correctly. And we outlined how we use, uh, recently we outlined how, how, outlined how we can use a combination of what we call triple motor mapping in the asleep setting. That's a combination of transcranial motor evoked potentials, low frequency bipolar motor stimulation, combined with high frequency monopolar stimulation to increase our safety using this approach. So with this approach, we're able to, for tumors in close proximity to the motor cortex, identify the cortical spinal tract in just under 90% of cases, so very high rate. We are able, uh, we're predominantly able to identify the cortical spinal tract, which results in an excellent median extended resection of 98% and under 3% rate of permanent motor neurologic deficit. So this triple motor mapping approach, that's been a, a real game changer in helping us maximize extended resection, even for patients who are asleep. So a common question we get asked in this setting is what do we test um, and how do we do it? So, you know, the major factor to think about here is that your goals intraoperatively are really determined before you get to the operating room. So this is a preoperative identification of functional or uh, functional areas or functional relevance as determined by the patient. And this is where counseling and meeting with our patients matter matters um, in the preoperative setting. And so th through this site-specific testing, we can tailor our intraoperative mapping and what needs to be employed. So you can see here a schematic. I know this is a busy slide, but you can see, again, focusing on language specifically, our mapping strategies may vary a little bit, whether you're talking about insular cortex with temporal lobe, and that's okay. It's really patient-specific and modality-specific, depending upon where the tumor is in the patient's interest. You know, for the purposes of this talk, I wanted to include all of the published data. So five years were uh, or 100, over 160 articles worth of published data to show what functional modalities have been tested in the intraoperative setting for language, cognition, sensory motor, et cetera. Um, and you can see that there's many, many, many modalities that can be tested. And to be honest, looking at this busy slide here, there's actually little consensus on which is what's the best and what outcome measures are best. This is a summary uh, meta-analysis and uh, review article we did with uh, our European colleagues that basically showed our functional parameters and outcomes really vary quite a bit depending upon where you are in the world. But it's very important that you and your team um, have a testing modality, a testing um, uh, battery that works for you and it's reliable working with your anesthesiologist and measure the outcomes that you get for your patients. So with that, I'll shift focuses just a little bit into our second goal, which is to understand and think about how do we see infiltrative tumor? How do we visualize it? And we've talked about how to protect the brain and so in, in, from uh, protect important non-tumor brain regions as we're carrying out the resection, but how do we visualize tumor? Really it boils down to two important methods. One tool, is using a labeling dye system and the other is a label-free dye system. There are a number of different modalities for either and both stimulated Raman histology, fluorescent sodium, and 5-aminolipulinic acid are three approaches that we'll drill down on today with a little more in a little more detail. So first and foremost, we can see that 5-aminolipulinic acid is a prodrug that can be given to patients administered three hours prior to surgery. And this drug accumulates in glioma cells, so it's tumor cell specific, and is turned into protoporphyrin 9, which is fluorescent under certain conditions. So the proper filter, uh, with the proper filter used, you can visualize in a fluorescent pink color, which is the tumor cells accumulating this drug, which has been metabolized into protoporphyrin 9. 
And there's evidence in support of this approach. You can see here a published report um, in Lancet Oncology by Stumer et al. in 2006, which showed when you compare 5 ALA with white light, there was an increased extended resection they were able to achieve. And you can see here that the positive predictive value, meaning the percentage of all biopsies taken from the, the, the brightly fluorescent area that have tumors, quite high, 97%. And the percentage of biopsies taken from non-fluorescent areas that don't have tumor is roughly 37%. Moving on, we know that sodium fluorescein is another labeling system that can be used. Again, this is given intravenously in the operating room and it given it, uh, immediately at the time of general anesthetic or induction of anesthesia. This relies on a leaky blood-brain barrier and also gives us an excellent positive predictive value. Although the negative predictive value, meaning showing that there is no tumor in, in specimen that, that also fluoresces, is not quite as good. So it's a little muddier of a system, but it is, it is easy to use with a very high safety profile. We've been really excited in the last minute, I'll share we've been really excited about an optical imaging tool called stimulated Raman histology. And we've just finished a preliminary trial and have another trial coming on board and utilize, utilizing the technology based on advances in fiber laser technology to um, image optically different metabolites within to, uh, 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 any sort of biological tissue. So this label-free system gives us high resolution, res resolution unprocessed images, um, really focused on differences in vibration properties of lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And using this approach, you're able to sample tumor margin samples, uh, tumor margins to identify whether the pre presence or absence of tumor within each of these tumor specimens. And you can see here again, looking at correlation or agreement or kappa agreements between using our molecular image imaging and our stimulated Raman histology, there was high agreement or an 80% uh, over 80% agreement when you look at these two modalities side by side. So that was really promising results that resulted as us leading to a next stage, which is a clinical trial that we'll have coming on board in the next several months. I'll finish with this one slide and say that we covered in rapid fashion a number of really important topics with respect to why we operate and how to maximize safety. Um, anybody who wants to read further, there have been a number of review series on this topic. The Journal of, uh, Neurosurgery Journal recently asked Dr. Berger and I to put together um, a series of thought uh, thought leaders in this in this area, and this is the result. This review series is now up on the website in Neurosurgery Journal. Most of these articles are free, um, and you can dig deeper into any of the concepts that you may want to understand a little bit better. So with that, I'll stop and say thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to meet with you guys, and I can take any questions. You can email me or call at any time.